Welcome to our video, sizing steel columns, focusing on the methodology that we use in a general way in going about this process. We've already talked about the notion that there are two general ways for a column to fail. One is by yielding of the material. So if we have a really fat uh, proportion for our column, it actually will either yield um, in a plastic flow kind of way, in which case it squashes or pancakes out, or if it's a brittle material like concrete, it shatters and kind of explodes and shards fly in every direction. Fat columns are really great. They're very sturdy. They're very stalwart. They give it their all, and then when they fail, they fail by yielding. So the critical or failure stress for a fat column is F yield for the material. It generally takes a very large force, relatively speaking, to fail a column with fat proportions. A column with slender proportions fails by elastic instability. In other words, long before we get to the yield stress of the material, the column begins to change shape radically and abruptly and gets out from under the load. The classic overall buckling behavior is the column takes on a new shape, uh, which is a half a sine curve. And once that process starts, it is not self-limiting. So you see a little bit of bulging and then it's instantly gone. Um, columns of slender proportion tend to be less efficient because we're simply not loading the material to as high a stress level as we would be if we took it all the way to yield. On the other hand, we have lots of columns we design that fail by buckling or that's their limiting state. And we still do that because the column is so efficient that even though there's more material in it than we would like to put there uh, from a material expenditure point of view, um, the column is still extremely efficient structurally in that it may carry a thousand times its own weight uh, in applied load. And from an economic point of view, uh, it still represents a very practical kind of column. In the case of buckling, we have a formula which was developed by a German mathematician named Euler. E-U-L-E-R is pronounced in German Euler. And um, his theory said that for this simple pin-pin column, which was the case he started with, the failure or critical stress for a slender column like this is pi squared times E, which is the stiffness of the material, divided by this ratio squared. This is the length to something we call the radius of gyration. And for our purposes, radius of gyration is a technical term and not even really appropriate. So we're going to call R our first order mathematical indicator of breadth. So R is the radius of gyration of the cross section and it is what we're going to call the lateral dimension or the effective breadth of the column. I want you to notice this is a material property, the yield stress of the material. E is a material property. It's the stiffness of the material. Those two things don't exist in the same formula. This is the mode of failure for fat. This is the critical material property for a slender column. Now, we mentioned in a previous discussion that in fact for a pin-pin beam, or column rather, the actual length of the column is also equal to the effective length. So this formula is fairly simple. There's just an L here. We also talked about the fact that sometimes we constrain columns either with a moment connection or a partial moment connection at the bottom, that that affects the effective length. Um, that is expressed in the steel manual by this multiple K times L. K is called the um, effective length factor and KL is the effective length. I've personally never liked this formula. Uh, 
formulation because K does not have a meaning, meaningful physical expression. But for our purposes, in, in terms of this particular exercise, uh, we don't need to worry about the meaning of K. I just want you to know that every time you come across this expression KL, that means effective length, and for the purposes of our current discussion, we could just as easily express that as L. So sometimes you'll see KL in the course of this discussion. When you look in tables, in some of my graphs you'll just see L. You should understand in this context those two things mean exactly the same thing. All these potential ways of fixing a column, by the way, produce a very complex array of possible effective lengths. Your engineer will deal with that, and it's a mess, and just understand that it's one of the things you're paying the engineer for. Um, it's very common that if you have a state of partial fixity here, uh, which effectively shortens the effective length, the engineer may go ahead and assume that the effective length is the full actual length, which is the conservative thing to do. That will cause the column to be slightly over-designed, but because columns are inherently so efficient, it's generally better to err on that side than to do a lot of complex calculations that one might not even have that much confidence in. Okay, so here we have, for slender columns, a formula, which we call Euler, Euler's equation, and we're going to go do a plot, and we're going to look at what that curve looks like. And one of the things we know is that when the slenderness ratio gets very low, the denominator is going to zero, and the failure stress relative to buckling goes to infinity. And likewise, when the column becomes very slender, the denominator becomes very large, and then the critical stress approaches zero. So that's a verbal description of what this is going to, go, going to look like. So we go look at that diagram, and on the bottom here we're plotting the slenderness ratio, which is always expressed as a dimensionless quantity. It's the length in inches over the radius of gyration in inches. You'll notice we don't go beyond 200 because the steel manual feels that that's not even prudent to be doing that. It's too inefficient, it's too unpredictable, and they're basically saying you can go beyond that but we're not going to make tables for you because we think it's generally not the domain you should be heading into. Now you'll notice here we have a plot this curve right here is the uh, predicted failure stress based on Euler's equation. So if we continued this on out far enough to huge values of L over R, this would effectively approach to zero. Likewise, if we go all the way into zero slenderness, which is another way of saying infinite fatness, um, we would predict infinite stress based on Euler's formula. Now, we know nothing can handle infinite stress, so um, Euler's formula clearly has limitations. It works great out here. It is everything that we need. When we get in close to uh, into the fairly fat domain, uh, or very non-slender, um, we have another limit that kicks in, which is the yield stress of the material. Clearly the material doesn't go to infinite stress. It's capped off at 36 KSI, if that's the yield stress grade that we're dealing with, or it can stop at 50 KSI or at 65. Now, this diagram uh, shows some sharp corners here. In other words, we're running out the yield stress until it runs into the Euler curve and we're always saying well we could continue the yield stress out beyond that but it wouldn't be a meaningful part of the curve because we could never get up to that yield stress because it's always going to buckle at some lower stress due to this limitation set by Euler buckling. And likewise there's no point in extending this curve up 
except that of course somebody might come up with a stress grade up there that we'd, we would want to account for. But if all we're dealing with is say uh, common wide flange sections, we would not include this portion of the Euler curve because we can never get to it because we're capped off by the 65 KSI limit on the yield stress of that particular material. Now this is a really clean picture with sharp corners here. Uh, the reality is that the transition from fat behavior that's limited by yield stress to slender behavior that's limited by this buckling curve, which varies according to the amount of slenderness, um, that clean curve of this going across and then abruptly transitioning into that uh, doesn't actually happen. There's a sort of intermediate behavior, which is much more complex. Uh, yielding of really fat pieces is pretty predictable. Uh, as long as we're out in a fairly slender regime, the Euler formula is very predictable, but the theory in between is really messy. And in fact, typically we do that by experimentation. Um, we have certain theories that describe that intermediate behavior, but ultimately we have to be careful to do experiments to verify what works. So I'm going to redraw this curve with these sharp corners, and then I'm going to add the smoothed off portions, and it looks basically like this. So here we got our 36 KSI, 50 KSI, um, 65 KSI, and out here we have generally pure buckling. Right in here we have pure yielding, and then in between we have this sort of rounded off behavior. Um, and as I said, the theory that describes this is really messy. And if you look in the steel manual, the formula that they've reduced down to describe this is really messy. But the nice thing is they give us that information in tabular form, or if they haven't given it to us for every stress grade, they give us the formula and then we can crank it out in tabular form in an Excel spreadsheet. So in other words, I have curves for this, curves for that, and curves for that, and uh, also for other common shapes. Right now, for the purposes of this course, we're going to tend to take this 50 KSI curve as the standard grade that we deal with when we come to wide flanges, and we're going to go look at some other grades that have to do with uh, round, pipe and HSS round. HSS means, by the way, hollow steel section. So we have HSS round, HSS square, wide flanges, and pipe. So we show that here. And I apologize right off the bat for the tiny print, but I'm going to leave it this way for a few moments because I want to I want to describe to you the general organization of this set of data. So you'll look up here, and this is KL over R. In other words, this is the slenderness ratio. It runs from zero all the way down to 66, and then it takes up again here, it goes 67 all the way down to 133, and then finally all the way to this limit of 200, which generally the steel industry encourages you not to go beyond. Across here I've got 35 KSI steel, uh, 42 KSI, 46, and 50, and then I've repeated those again. So in other words, <coughs> This table is dealing with four different stress grades, and they correspond to pipe. This is sort of standard plumbing pipe, which has been adapted to structural purposes. Its uh, designated yield stress is 35 kips per square inch. HSS round, which has a yield stress of 42 KSI. When we take this round and we squash it into square, we work hard in it, and so actually it goes up to 46 KSI. And then we have wide flanges, and we've just included the 50 KSI because that's kind of our most common grade. And that's a common grade also for not just wide flanges, but angles and channels also. So on this table, we have the critical or failure compressive stress for various grades of steel as a function of the slenderness ratio. So you'll notice 
the best we can do for a 36, in fact, let me go to the next page, which is kind of a blow up. Uh, this is just viewing the upper half of that previous page. So we're only going down to 27 for the slenderness ratio. <clears throat> the key thing here is at a slenderness ratio of zero, you can't beat that for being fat. It can't buckle because it doesn't even have any length. And that's kind of an absurd number, but for the purposes of this table, you can take that 35 KSI as the yield stress of the material. And then as soon as we begin to develop some length, we start having this intermediate behavior. But you'll notice that intermediate behavior is not having much effect until we get down to a slenderness ratio of 23 or so, in which case we've dropped from 35 KSI as the critical or failure stress down into the neighborhood of 34 K. Also, if we wanted to do, uh, let's just go one more here for 50 KSI steel, which would be typical of what we might have for a wide flange. Um, as we go to more and more slender, um, it diminishes down from there. Um, and that's sort of the general behavior. The lower half of the table looks like the following. Um, and the reason I'm jumping down to the lower half is I want to just go grab a number here for a slenderness ratio of 125. So L over R is 125. Um, we end up with a failure stress of 15.73 for the 35 KSI material. And then for all these other three grades, they just listed as 16.065. So the difference between that and that is only 2% or less. So what this is saying is when you get to a slenderness ratio of 125, from this point on, all the grades are performing about the same. If you have a very slender column, you don't want to invest in a higher grade of steel because it's not buying you anything because the only important material property that's affecting the capacity of that column is the stiffness of the material and all these grades of steel have the same stiffness. Okay, so I'm going to jump back up to the top of this table for a moment and let it sit there while I go over some basic things. In steel, you can invent any cross section you want to. You can make it a whole set of welded up plates, which is very common. Um, you can take something like wide flanges and channels and weld them together to create some kind of composite column. Uh, when you do that, you're making a stab in the dark about what you think your column design ought to be. You have a certain situation, some kind of axial load you want to resist, some kind of length for the column, and you're trying to design a cross section. And design is an iterative process. It's trial and error. So when you go about it in that way, um, you have to draw up a cross section. Somebody has to calculate a bunch of really important cross sectional properties. And then they have to go um, figure out what the slenderness ratio is. Then they have to find the allowed stress. Then they have to go calculate the allowed stress times the area to finally figure out the capacity of that column. It's a pretty involved process, but it is a generalized process, which means you can invent any kind of column shape you want to, um, as long as you've got an engineer who will work with you who has enough patience to crank those numbers. Almost all of the columns, though, that we build are pretty much standard sections. Uh, unless we have a column that we really want to celebrate in some way and make into some kind of architectural expression, we'll typically use some fairly standard sections. So we're going to go through an example here that talks about how we generate some more useful tables. Because right now this table um, is, involves a lot of work to carry a design process forward. So we're going to take a little example here. We're going to say, consider a standard weight nominal four inch steel pipe column with an effective length of 14 feet. Um, we're going to figure out a slenderness table, a slenderness ratio for this, and then we're going to go back into our 
critical stress table and we're going to figure out how much capacity this 4 inch steel pipe column has at a length of 14 feet. So we're going to go through this example and while you're doing it I want you to just understand the basic concept and what's going to be kind of cool is once we develop an understanding of the meaning of this method we're then going to learn that we have a whole bunch of tables that have been generated for us for all the standard column shapes where we can just zip into those tables and find the lightest section that satisfies our needs. But we want to understand where those tables come from. So we're going to start with this example, a nominal 4-inch steel pipe column with an effective length of 14 feet. So we say our slenderness ratio is the effective length over the breadth, which is KL over R, and we've said the effective length for a simple pin-pin column is its actual length, so we put 14 feet there. Now the question is, where do you find R? Um, in the steel manual, you'd find it early on in the book under a section called Dimensions and Properties, and R is one of the properties that they calculate for every common shape. Um, if you were in the steel manual or in the textbook, you could go to the chapter on columns or axial members, which includes columns, and you'll find some tables there. So we're going to go look at what one of those tables looks like for steel pipe. And this is what it looks like. Now, we said a standard, so this is extra strong, double extra strong, those just have thicker walls, but our original problem statement was we're going to focus on a standard 4 inch pipe. So, uh, this circle by the way should be right around the standard there to say that's what we're looking at. <coughs> and if we go to the bottom of this table, we'll find that the area of this section has been calculated. This says AG, which G stands for gross. Lots of other places we use other kinds of areas like the net area after holes have been drilled or whatever. So this sounds kind of redundant because you're going to assume this is gross area, but this is the gross area in inches squared for a standard four inch steel pipe is 3.17. So I'm going to jump back up to the top of this and then I'm going to go to this calculation and excuse me, I got the wrong information out of the table. Let me go back again. I want to find R. R is 1.51 inches. So as I say, you can find it in these tables or you can go back to uh, chapter 2 of the book or the chapter in the steel manual on dimensions and properties. But this is all pre-calculated for you for any kind of standard shape. So we got 1.51. So I take 14 feet divided by 1.51 inches then I got to clean up my units because the slenderness ratio is supposed to be dimensionless. And when I calculate all that out, I get 111.3. All right. Now, if we go to our tables, let me find that right here. This is again, our critical compressive stress for various grades of steel. I've squeezed it down so that we can see the top. And we can also see 111, 112. So um, at 111 slenderness ratio, the critical stress is 18.6 to 9. Uh, it goes down as the column becomes more slender. We're at 11.3. And you don't need to go through these numbers, but for the mathematics I've done here, I've interpolated between those two numbers to get us to 111.3. So I go back here and I find that the critical uh, stress or failure stress is 18.57 kips per square inch, which I got through that interpolation process. Now, if I want to know the critical or failure force P, axial force P, that this column will resist, I need to take this stress which is the failure stress, and multiply that times the area. Now, in order to do that, I got to go back to this table again and scroll down. And now I'm looking for, whoops, I hate it when I grab the wrong thing. 
This is just annoying. Okay, so there's the area. Gross area, 3.17. So I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to multiply this critical stress times the area, and I get 50.8.85 kips. So that's going to be the failure load for this nominal 4-inch standard steel pipe of effective length 14 feet. 4 inches is not too big. And think about it, it's holding 60 kips almost. Now, you'll recall that we always have to have a fee factor in front of every member, which accounts for the fact that we don't have absolute confidence that this column is exactly straight, that it was manufactured exactly right, that it was installed straight, that the material was ex everything we said it was. So we have a fee factor. We're going to multiply this number times a so-called resistance factor, which for steel columns is 0.85. And when we multiply all that together, we say the design strength and axial compression for this column is 50.03, or we can round it out to 50. Now, here's what's cool. This is really cool. We went through this once. We understand the principle. Now we're going to discover that all this mathematics has been done for us many times. And now we don't have to go back to this critical stress or fee or any of these calculations or finding R, we can, we can eliminate all of that and we can go straight to the table. And this is the table, basically. So we're going to look at a standard 4-inch pipe and an effective length of 14 feet. So we're going to come across here and we arrive at this point and it says 50.0 kips, which is exactly the number we had. <coughs> from our own calculation. In other words, we have verified that we know where that number comes from. And this table, which is given this number in the book, and you should go tab that number, that uh, table, because you'll be asked to use it for design purposes. This table gives the so-called design strength in axial compression, which is this Mathematically, is designated like this, but this is in kips. So if I had given you a design problem that said, uh, find the lightest standard section, and by the way, I'm going to do something here. I want to emphasize that standard pipe generally is more efficient because it tends to be generally more fat. And that's not what I want to do, but I want to get across the notion here that when you go into this table, you're looking for, almost always, your starting point is to look for a standard pipe. Every once in a while, these extra strong ones will show up, but they're generally not what we're after. So um, if I had asked you, uh, if I'd said, you have a column, with uh, 96 kips in it. In fact, let's make that 92 just to make this problem a little trickier. You have uh, an effective length of 10 feet and you're trying to support 92 kips. Find the lightest section. You'd come down to an effective length of 10 feet and you might scan across here and you would come to this one and you'd say, oh, that's good. That That just barely supports it. However, when you look back, you say, wait, that's an extra strong. It weighs 15 pounds a linear foot. Here's a standard that weighs less, and because it's standard, it will also cost less on a per pound basis, and it supports 104. So you might want to go in and yellow or uh, highlight the standard columns just to make sure that you're usually seeking there first. But this is really cool. You needed a 10-foot column, and you knew what force it had to resist. And this table allows you to instantly, essentially instantly, go find the best column, which in this case is a nominal 5-inch pipe 
uh, standard wall thickness, which by the way we sometimes call schedule 40, this time sometimes it's called schedule 80, um, but in the steel manual this is called standard. Okay, so we got a bunch of tables that uh, you're going to get introduced to over time, and those tables will show standard sections that we commonly look for columns, and they provide these kinds of design tables where once you know what load you have and what effective length you have, you can zip right to finding the correct section. That ends our introduction to the methodology for sizing steel columns.